Well, greetings and welcome back to our second part of our conversation in religion as we focus on prophetic lament resources for uh, this time and both the pandemic as well as these other significant moments that we are facing and the call for racial justice and challenges of division and division and divisiveness in our country and economic challenges and just so much that 2020 has has caused us to enter into a posture and a place uh, where a topic that has always been important is maybe more relevant than ever. And so I've been grateful for the conversation we've already had about lament and hearing from each of my colleagues, just some wonderful uh, insight and uh, helpful information and perspective. And the goal is that as we've listened to these different doorways, pathways into the topic of lament, that they will cause us further reflection, uh, conversation, uh, doing some other reading, uh, and finding other ways to allow this topic to really become a part of, of how we process not just this, but other things that happen in our personal lives, in our communities, in our world. And so in this part two, uh, we're going to just have a little uh, debrief time. And uh, as we shared at the beginning, I appreciate so much Andy Edward as one of our students being our first responder. And so uh, we're going to allow uh, him to ask some questions and get the ball rolling. We have a question or two that came in during the first part that we'll uh, we'll reflect on, and then we'll probably ask each other some things as we uh, have listened to one another talk about uh, this important topic. Uh, so David, go ahead and get us started as we uh, have some discussion time now out of, out of what we've heard already. All right, yeah, thanks a lot. So, uh, so Andy, I'm curious, you know, as you've heard all of us uh, reflect on this topic of, you know, prophetic lament, um, I wonder what your initial thoughts are. Uh, what's What's coming up for you as you hear these reflections, especially what's relevant to your, your own life, uh, your own ministry, uh, and things like that. So tell us what, what you're uh, thinking about here. Um, well, based off everything that was said today, um, it, it showed me that lament is, is larger than what I thought it was. Um, there was one thing in particular that really stuck out to me uh, was when uh, Professor Julian said that violence can be structural and violence must be widened. And honestly, I've all, you know, as a human being, we look at violence as always something physical and, you know, sometimes verbal, but mainly something physical. But just looking how like a system can really be detrimental to um, a, a race, a, a community, a particular religion, or and whatnot. And I'm just like, wow, that really hit home for me because I never looked at how, vi how you can build violence. Like, you know, not in the sense of like, oh, it goes from me to you, but establish something that can really affect other people's lives. So that is great. And also for you, um, Dr. Young, when you, you, you said, um, L lament acknowledge that something is wrong with the world and th th that's the thing that's just tough sometimes is that you know when you're lamenting about something and you want to be heard like how do you deal with like people not acknowledging your lament mm -hmm. and you know but it takes like for you to go crazy or to be violent for someone to get it, but even when you become violent, even when you um, become belligerent in any way possible, they're still not hearing. Mm. So it's just like lament. So it, my thing is, it's just like, is lament something strictly divine? Is it just like, do you, is it only a situation where you only, you know, only God can really show you that this person is really hurt, like the depths of their heart and whatnot. So th those two things, they, they really stuck out to me and just, just really thinking about that and, and whatnot. So those are my initial thoughts um, mm. on this particular matter. Yeah. I just want to kind of follow up with that. Um, this whole idea of what you do when, when people don't, when other people don't hear your lament or don't take it seriously. And I mean, I don't think I have an answer to that. Um, but I think that one of the things that I see in scripture is that like we see many instances of that, right? Like, I mean, again, thinking of the, the people who are in slavery in Egypt, crying out to God, 
Pharaoh's not hearing their lament, right? Or if he does, his response is get back to work and do twice as much as you did before, right? And, but, but God hears, right? So there's this hope. I mean, and, you know, I think in real sort of practical live life, like that's tough because we sort of kind of, is God really hearing, right? But I think the scriptural witness is that God does hear, right? Um, or I think about like the story of Hagar, right? Like the God who sees, uh, that God sees her even when everybody around her doesn't see her, right? So there's this, there's this sort of prophetic hope uh, that there is this God who sees and hears um, even when those around us don't see and hear and don't take our lament seriously. I don't think that sort of solves the problem because other people not hearing your lament is still really problematic, right? Especially when it's a life and death situation. Uh, but I mean, in some ways, that's where I find so much hope in the gospel. I mean, as Phil talked about, this God who suffers with us, right? Um, that's where I find so much hope in the gospel is to know that I'm never alone in whatever I'm facing, right? There's always this God who is with me. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to uh, even jump in at that point on some of those. Yeah, just, just, just to say again that that hope is in, implicit and in, even in the, in the offering of that cry of despair, right? And even when I say, God, you're nowhere, there's this, there's this reality that I'm, my God, why have you forsaken me? You're not here, but I somehow hope or believe that you're here enough for me, for you to hear me say, you're not here, right? There's this assumption even built into that, that somehow God must hear me saying, God, you're absent. Um, and so even in that cry, there's, it's still directed to God, which is why it's prayer and it's offering, it's worship. So lament is worship because we offer even this despair, even this brokenness to God. And there is an in, implicit intrinsic hope that is future, right? It is that I don't feel this now, but I'm right. And that vow of praise in the Psalm, I don't, I might not even feel it now, but I will hope, I will trust, I will praise. Um, and so I, yeah, I, I appreciate that connection to, to hope. And then in, in terms of the, the reality of people around, the, around us, not hearing our lament, um, I think when we broaden our, our understanding that lament is the response anytime there is grief, which is the response, the reality anytime there is loss, and that loss takes so many forms. And we don't always acknowledge loss well in other people's lives. And we don't have liturgies and practices um, like we do when someone dies. We we have things we do, even if it's too, for too short a time. Uh, but I, I'm so fascinated by the concept of ambiguous loss by Pauline Boss, uh, who talks about when someone is physically present but psychologically absent or psychologically absent and physically present. And so a spouse whose partner has Alzheimer's and they're no longer the person, that person is already grieving and is experiencing loss and should be able to express lament. But until her that partner dies, we don't do anything. We don't recognize it. We don't see that it is still lost right now. And it's, so it's ambiguous loss, frozen grief, she calls it. And, and so we, you know, part of this awakening, I think, and, and learning about lament is to open our eyes to the suffering of others and to hear that cry of lament. Um, and then it's for so many things, right? For injustice, the, uh, you know, the person who is in addiction, the person who is, uh, you know, battling, you know, the loss of some ability, right? Because of physical, um, you know, something that's happened physically to them. There's just so many things, right? And so to honor one another by listening to those expressions of loss and, and lament is, is a great way to uh, just honor and respect each other. There's one piece missing here, I think, in our group, and that's sort of drama, theater, yeah. the visual, right? You know, I mean, the, the psalms were sung, but they were also acted out, right? You know, lament was something you did and uh, so whether it's sackcloth and ashes or whether it's weeping in the middle of the people or whatever and um it, it probably for me it, is it tends to make it a cognitive thing right you know a rational thing rather than an embodied thing and uh i so that's kind of a piece that's missing here so the liturgy but also the drama um in in the in that human sense of the word right you know yeah. uh the portrayal of that and the expression of that 
is something that um, I'm trying to take a little more seriously in my life because I tend to be more cognitive and rational, right? You know, yet realizing because of maybe it's coming home because of COVID, but other personal events in my life that have raised this issue for me, right? You know, so my, my posture, my body, my attitude, my thoughts, my feelings are, 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 I express differently now than I did maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, I would love to kind of share a poem um, that kind of connects to this. Yeah. When I think of what happens when we're not listening to um, each other's laments, the reality of those who are lamenting ends up just getting buried. Absolutely. And those who lament um, end up having to wear the mask to conceal and hide their feelings. Um, and one of the things I did as part of my course on MLK was um, study respectability and how respectability functions for those who are um, who identify as the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized. And respectability is wearing the mask. It's trying to do your best to function in the ways that the status quo expects you to show up. I um, mean, there's this poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar called, We Wear the Mask. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile. With torn and bleeding hearts we smile in mouth with mirrored subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but O oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but O oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise, we wear the mask. And like this poem, you know, is was written by an African American reflecting on the system of slavery and what slavery demanded um, from slaves uh, in order to endure the pain and suffering of showing up and working. You had to conceal how much uh, grief and sorrow you were carrying. And part of connecting um, respectability to activism and protest means that by taking off the mask and admitting that something is wrong and hurting and showing up and protesting and complaining is taking off the mask is allowing yourself to um, reveal the pain that has been stirring inside of you so i thought that was an interesting visual to connect for both racism and of course uh, our present covid19 struggle where we're all trying our best to try and interpret and understand each other behind these masks and um, that added visual layer is just, you know, so profound. A barrier, yeah. It's yeah, if, if I could just... Have a uh, oh, go ahead. You sure, oh. Julian? You can go yeah, ahead. Matt and then Julian. Okay. Yeah, so just to kind of uh, reflect on Andy's question there, um, I, I do suspect the... Um, how we communicate our suffering is probably going to be different based on the type of suffering that it is, right? If it's interpersonal, I think that's one thing. But if we're talking about systematic sin, right, and cycles of oppression and those kind of things, uh, I think it's, as Pastor Rose just mentioned, uh, I mean, I think protest needs to be a significant component of how we lament, um, communicating um, this, this eschatological hope, right, that we are partnering with God for the redemption of God's creation. Right? Like, this is our hope, this is our vision, this is how we ultimately live out our lives. And, and I think at times it might involve getting in some holy trouble or some um, <laughs> sacred difficulty at some level. Uh, and so, and so I, I think, and I, th I think your question, depending on what, on what we're talking about lamenting, I think we can interpret it differently. But I, th I think if we're talking about like systematic racism, systematic sexism, if we're talking about those kind of things. Uh, I think, I think we need to um, not just cry out to God. I mean, we certainly do cry out to God. It's a significant component, and, and we ask God to bring about change. Uh, but if if we're trying to push and communicate to people in our communities um, that are engaging in acts of destructiveness towards ourselves and towards others, uh, I think we need to turn up the pressure a little bit. I think we need to march. I think we need to protest. I think we need to proclaim. I think we need to, um, I mentioned earlier, just get in a little bit of holy trouble. 
I mean, the complaint is, you know, interwoven with, with lament, right? So how long, right? Why? How long, O Lord? And so those are, those are protests. Those are protestations, right? Are, are forms of lament for sure. Julian, you were going to say something. Yeah, I um, definitely, it's all connected. So I was just thinking as I was hearing Andy's question and Rose talk, it's like, as a white person, um, uh, you know, we have Robin D'Angelo who talks about white fragility. And I think, I think it's really hard. There's a, the fragility in me doesn't want to hear the lament, you know? And so I was like, wow, what is, what is, the, what is that? What is a, um, like a structural lament or a systemic evidence of lament? And I think what they're saying is protest. And I was like, oh, Black Lives Matter. Like, no wonder there's pushback of <laughs> Black Lives Matter. I mean, it gets to the, the white fragility that I think so many of us deal with consciously or unconsciously. But it'd be interesting to look at Black Lives Matter as uh, an organizational um, lament, you know, or a, a way of lament that's not individual, but is a, a communal way. Yeah, and so to, to say all lives matter or, or whatever else the you know, ignorant pushback is, is, is to deny lament, right? It is to deny the, the sorrow, the suffering, the, the grief, um, the, uh, the injustice, right? And so to trivialize or just to, to flippantly you know, put back some kind of answer, well, yeah, but, is, is not to enter into to the posture of lament. And I think that's, we, we have so failed to do this at all levels that, that we're just completely broken when it comes to our inability to not only lament ourselves, but certainly to enter in and listen to anyone other, any other person's lament um, and to take that um, sacred gift, right, of, of, being, of having, having heard that um, and and sit with that and and respond with that and um, yeah I I just find that the uh, inability to lament and to you know to weep the tears of the world to to lament with the brokenness around us um, you know we fail to be human in our response to that yeah I just had to I suspect even the cry no justice no peace yeah. that has been weaponized by white America as a threat is actually just a somber lament. Yeah, it's a there is no justice, we'll have no peace. Yeah, absolutely. Andy, at this point, I want to come back to you and see if there's any other questions you want to bring to the pa panel as you're uh, reflecting on, on some of what you've heard here. Yes, um, I definitely had another question. Um, I know sometimes that um, we can use scripture to just answer questions that are still unanswered. Um, for example, um, I might be going through something and somebody can be like, well, you know what Paul says in Timothy, you know, endure like a good soldier, but I don't know how to endure this because it's so buried in here. So my, my question is, it's general to whoever, how, just as we did before, um, how important is the role of patience when it comes to the process of waiting uh, for your request to be answered. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's Sorry. a tough one. Anybody want to want to jump in there? I would love to hear from Dr. LaFountain because he's he's been on a roll tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, the language of patience is incredibly important, especially as we rethink um, uh, the nature of like eschatology, the role of the church in the world. Uh, the place of the people of God. So I, when I think about patience, uh, I, the context I think about it in is this context that uh, is presented by the post-liberal tradition, particularly the cry that America, American Christians are in bondage to American culture, right, you know? And so a lot of my lament is how do we uh, set free a church to really be the church in America? You know, and you've got this radical materialism, individualism, you've got um, uh, uh, radical political uh, positions, you know, and so we place America higher than the church, right, in the kingdom. And uh, so, uh, so language that I get from people like Rodney Clapp and Stanley Harwas and uh, uh, others 
is that, um, you know, it's that patient endurance for us as we do the things the church does, right? Just, just be the church, you know? So people say, well, well, how do we get out of this? You know, and the, the, the answer, it sounds a little trite at first, but it's really not when you understand the dynamics of it is be the church, right? You know, um, now that doesn't directly address the issue of the person, the individual who's encountering a challenge in life in the context of uh, the church that he or she is in. But I think the advice is the same uh, in the sense that, hey, be that faithful person that continues to walk through your life and that patient trust that comes from knowing that God has a future for us that we're, going, or that we're walking into. And uh, it doesn't take away the pain, doesn't take away the, the problem per se, but it, it puts it in perspective, you know, it gives it a context. Um, and I think in America, we struggle with a lot of things that are free floating, right? You know, free floating kinds of challenges because we refuse to see ourselves as people in community. We, we don't share it with other Christians. We don't uh, think about ourselves as being a part of the people of God. It's just me, I, myself alone, and I bear that whole burden. So I've got to grit it out. I've got to, you know, um, muscle it up and uh, push forward. When in fact, that's not the truth at all, right? That's not the gospel. That's not the hope of the people of God. Uh, I probably danced around your question appropriately, Andy, uh, but I'm okay with my response. <laughs> and re real quick, be be before that, I mean, um, so patience, we all know, um, Paul tells us in Galatians, patience is the fruit of the spirit. And it, it's one of the, the, the fruit. So because like, you know, if, as a Christian, but also an African-American, um, if my rights are being violated, um, I'm supposed to still respond with the evidence of the fruit, which would also be love. So my rights are being violated, but does God justify my rights being violated, okay, one, but me not responding in love. Like, because I think sometimes too, in still having patience and waiting for my request to be answered, um, I've encountered some African-American friends who are also Christian, who feel like their rights are being violated. So now I can break laws or become rebellious and belliger belligerent. So there's kind of two sides of the coin. You still have to be patient and waiting for God to answer the request. But at the same time, too, your response until God answers the request must still line up to his will. Um, but if I know I said a lot, but can we even touch on that also, including the question from before? Um, I hope that all made sense. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is where I think Martin Luther King Jr. has a lot to share and say with us. Um, because he was a man who went to seminary, um, studied the word, read uh, the passages where it said, slaves, obey your masters, and felt, okay, there's something wrong here. Um, because if I take this literally, um, then that means I cannot protest. Um, and there are certainly parts of scripture where I think we have to be careful when we're looking at a 2,000-year-old document and like taking it literally for our context. And there's like so much that uh, we need to weigh Paul's words about patience against like his reality that the end times was like so close to happening. And, and just like a lot of his advice about people staying in marriages that they shouldn't be in and all those other things, slaves, remaining slaves, wives, um, don't challenge the confines of your uh, patriarchal marriage right now we're just gonna have to wait this out because Jesus is coming back tomorrow. So that was a very different context than what we have today. So um, I think King has a lot to say and I think I would recommend reading uh, one of his essays, uh, Why We Can't Wait, and then also a letter from a Birmingham jail where King is writing, um, I'll start with the latter one. King is writing um, from a jail cell in Birmingham and ministers are, are publicly 
denouncing him, white ministers in America are telling him that he's doing the wrong thing. And King responds to them telling them, you know, like they're not, they're not doing the church the way that they should be. If they, um, if they were actually the church, they would be right alongside him where he was. And I think for King to take a radical, um, and he, a lot of what he says isn't even like reinterpreting scripture to some extent. It's, a lot of it is just like asking the church to really reflect and think of who we should be in our time. Um, and I would like to add on to what um, Phil was saying about the American culture and the values of like individualism, consumerism. Um, there are so many things in the United States that prevent um, us from really having a healthy practice of lament or hope or patience <laughs> because of the way our culture is set up. And there's not much uh, space for ambiguity and nuance. Like I think about this pandemic um, and how the president said, it'll be over very soon. Now that very soon was very different in March and it feels different now because we are almost a year into this. Um, so you can imagine for, for, for so many people listening to and, and, and believing in, in the certainty of his words, the farther and further away we get from when he first said it would be over very soon to where we are now, the less likely <laughs> we all are to really believe that it will be over very soon, which means that so many people are being stretched in their ability to understand um, one patient and hope. Uh, and we're having a perspective of, of not being able to to trust our leadership in, in and there's there's just so much tension right now. Um, I don't know if any of that answers your question, but I think it, for me, it just, I hope that just like, um, gives you something to ponder when we think about one, what, how we read scripture and um, how, we, how we read our present reality uh, for understanding and interpreting scripture. There is a sanctified impatience. I mean, there's appropriate role. Um, and I, I think if we use Jesus as a model, I, mean, I think we can argue. But the issue that was raised for me, Andy, and as Rose was sharing, is that how important the church is in this, uh, the ecclesial life, discernment, right? You know, Because I think the assumption that in your question was, how does the individual alone make that decision, right? You know, And I think that's a part of you know, the bondage that we're in. As a church, so I think the 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 process there, and this is where John Howard Yoder helps me so much, is that that's uh, an ecclesial discerning process where we submit ourselves to the you know the wisdom and guidance of the church, and and share with one another and struggle with it you know, um, and then out of that matrix act in some way. And who knows what the right answer is, what the right response is. But I think the preface is discernment, ecclesial process, and how the church together can respond to that, you know? Um, I don't know. Yeah, and I would just add, too, that lo love does not mean staying trapped in a, a vicious cycle of abuse. Um, I mean, a whole nother direction. Um, Christianity has been, been, you know, Christian theology has been utilized to tell women to stay stuck in abusive relationships with their spouses, which is not acceptable and not okay. True love means holding individuals accountable for their action. To truly love society, to love humanity, is to hope what's best for humanity, to actually hope that society can change, that we can actually live into this eschatological vision of the world to come. The, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Uh, so, so I don't think loving is is a passive act at all. I think it's responding faithfully uh, with impatience at times, as as Phil has suggested. I mean, I think of even even Jesus's turn the other cheek. Right? We often, without actually thinking about what's going on in that context, we hear that as just let yourself be abused. Right? Someone strikes you, turn the other cheek to the other. Uh, but in their society. Right? To hit someone with the back of your hand would have brought shame upon you and your family and your people. And so if someone smacks you and you turn, and then you turn the cheek the other way, their hand is over here. The only way that they can hit you back again is with the back of their hand. 
thus bringing shame and decreasing them and their family's honor. And so in a lot of ways, I suspect what Jesus is saying there is unmask evil for what it is. Allow your subtle acts of resistance to challenge the system that continues to push individuals down. So I don't think, I don't think loving is, is passive at all. I don't think it's allowing um, cycles and systems of traumatization to be at play in the world. I think to truly love the world the way that God loves the world is to fight for redemption, to fight for equity, and to fight for justice. Yeah. I think God was impatient with sin, set prophet after prophet. Jesus comes He's patient, waiting for people to repent, but he is not patient with sin. He's going to do something about it. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah, and and patience doesn't mean you know non-activity, right? So this posture of patience is is trusting for you know God's ultimate deliverance, the ultimate uh, you know fulfillment of of the recreation of all things, but that doesn't mean that we aren't involved and invited into the process as Matt just prayed, you know, from the prayer we're taught to pray, you know, that that kingdom would come now, right. And in various ways. And so it is both waiting, um, but there's work to be done in, in the waiting. And and I think that's important. If we could, there's one sort of question that came up uh, from, uh, our attendees that I wanted just to maybe close out with and some reflections on. And it actually relates to some things we've been saying uh, because it connects both to the importance of doing this work of lament together in community uh, and also what are the practices. And we've named even protests as a practice of lament, but what are some other uh, corporate practices? What are things that we do and can do together in community? So the, and it wasn't really in the form of a question. It was just asking about liturgy or act, action practices for engaging with lament in community. And so maybe we could just spend a little bit of time as we, as we wind down, just reflecting on some examples or, or what do we think about ways that we can do this work together of uh, prophetic lament uh, together. Thoughts anyone has about that as we... I mean, I think I'll just very simply, uh, just two things that come to mind for me. Um, is just one, like we can play music in a minor key, right? Uh, like it doesn't, not ever, not all music has to be like happy and upbeat all the time. And the other thing is just simply making space for lament. Like you can do that in a worship service where you just let people lament. Um, so I'm sure all of you probably have much more profound things to add. Uh, but I just think those are just some really simple things uh, yeah. that we can do. Yeah, one of my favorite lines, and I'm just dying to have somebody track down who actually first said this because nowhere can I find it. Uh, but they said that worship must always be funeral and fiesta. And it has to be both. So there is both the funeral dirge. I was talking to Rose, I think it was talking to Rose about this other little thing I want to explore someday. Um, it's the concept of a threnody. A threnody is a, uh, a funeral dirge or poem. And a long time ago, they were, they were very common and often written in after uh, great figures passed away. So there's the threnody of for Abraham Lincoln, threnody. There's these, there's these funeral, either poems or songs or uh, sort of funeral dirges that were written to mourn, right? And to lament. And they were, they were to be offered in that way. And so this, this reality that in our worship, which we have so slanted towards celebration, forgetting that whenever we gather in worship, there are people who are glad, sad, and mad. So um, there's a need and space that we need to have, as, as David said, to worship in major and minor keys, um, and to have their, yes, celebration, but also a place for funeral, also a place for sorrow. And if we aren't offering that and giving space for that and practices, permission, and language uh, to express sorrow, then we're violating our humanity. Um, and so I, I appreciate, you know, even though it does seem simple, David, it's not, and it's hard, right? And we don't have a lot of examples of that. And so that's a, a vital aspect. Other thoughts about communal practices? How do we do this together? I think, Rose, you were going to say something? Yeah, um, communal practices, tell the stories, learn the histories, and tell the stories. Um, tell the stories that challenge dominant understandings about you know, how we ended up here in these United States of America. Um, create spaces for confronting and um, lamenting 
the link between our history and our present reality. And I think part of the difficulty that people have with saying Black Lives Matter or um, showing up at protests or, or even having the willingness to, um, you know, just to hear a, a Black person lament about something that happened during their day, some racist incident, is because a lot of people have not had the opportunity or have not shaped a culture and understanding of these stories, like they have no access to them. And I think um, while empathy, you know, we tend to think of it as something that is like natural, you either have it or you don't. Um, but I, I'm of the belief that empathy can be cultivated and underneath empathy is narrative and that's um, grounded in telling those stories. And if you become practiced enough at telling those stories um, and listening to them, then when it comes time to show up, it's just as easy as breathing. So I think that for me is, you know, just just key. Tell the stories. Helpful. If you need um, book ideas, I got you. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I, and I concur. I was thinking of narrative in uh, uh, that sense and also another sense of the laments in, especially in the Psalms, are always in the context of the great stories of the acts of uh, Yahweh, you know. Uh, remembering those, uh, even if they're long, long, long past, right? Remembering them and hoping for the future. Um, but also, I think the laments and the historical psalms, where the story of Israel, right? How we got ourselves into this mess, this kind of thing, is also a part of that. And now that re relates very much to what Rose just said, uh, uh, as these stories of our national stories, people's stories, and our scriptural stories overlap and intertwine in so many wonderful ways. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, John, you'd know this for sure, but I think nearly a third of the Psalms are Psalms of Lament. Yeah. Is that right, John? Yeah. I mean, the percentage, <laughs> depending on your factor, it, it, it can go as high as, as like 60, 65%, depending on how okay. you, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's there for a reason. <laughs> Yeah, and so I mean, I think in terms of liturg liturgy and liturgical questions of worshiping life together, like, I mean, this is probably similar to David, like, as you suggested, yours is kind of basic level, like, uh, read the Psalms together, preach um, stories of lament, preach Psalms of lament, engage in corporate readings of lamentations together. Uh, I mean, I think in terms of a worship service, like, as you just create space, and there's such a breadth of it, even within the biblical narrative. Yeah. Yeah. I have something. Yeah. You're going to hear there's music playing in the background. I'm at a retreat house. Um, one of the things that comes to my mind is whenever there is conflict, there's likely either a loss that's already happened or a fear of loss. And it just makes me think like, what kind of practices do we need to have around conflict that happen in our communities all the time that might help us? you would begin to see more of lament. Because I was thinking about how story is so important and like, what would it be like if we, in our churches, you know, had people telling their stories around different political issues, ooh, you know, that really um, have a lot of tension around them, but not to tell the story of what they think is right or wrong, but what's the story underneath? The fears, the losses, the, you know, like, the, what's the human narrative? We're losing you there, Jolene, I think. The losses and the fears, it could be significant. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, so to think about cause, right? We don't think about, you know, what, what brought us to this point or what brought that person to respond in that way. And to recognize that so often it is some kind of loss, even if that's loss of expectation or loss of uh, the, the dream of what it should have been, what life should be, uh, unrealized expectation, connects to loss and so conflict i i'm so struck by how that ties into all this julene and and even the, the work of loss of identity yeah often there's something about our identity that we're threatened to be losing or you know going to be losing yeah so that's so helpful. Well, and i think that resonates with uh renee gerard's scapegoat theory right as individuals uh, people groups begin to feel like they're starting to lose their identity we see them scapegoating other groups of people yeah who's to blame yeah. Well, listen, friends, this has been rich and helpful. We could go on and we should find other ways to keep these conversations going. And 
Uh, hopefully it'll be a help and blessing to others. So thank you for being a part of this conversation. Thank you, uh, Andy, for joining us and uh, letting us hear uh, your processing of, of uh, what we've shared and that's been helpful as well. And uh, trust that we'll continue to find ways of sharing this uh, with a wider audience. So thanks for being part of this time. Uh, and uh, we trust that those who got a chance to listen to this as well as the first part will have a little more uh, opportunity to think about some of these things and, and even just some of the questions. Sometimes the questions tell us more than answers ever will. So uh, thanks for being part of it and the Lord bless you all. Good night. Bless you folks.